Excellent. Okay, so welcome everybody to our online seminar on key insights on transport and NDCs in the nationally determined contributions and long-term strategies of the Paris Agreement. My name is Christopher Decky. I'm the Director of Global Engagement, I'm sorry, Global Advocacy and Engagement in the SLOCAT Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport. Um, and I'm very happy to be here as your facilitator for this, for this seminar and uh, to let you all know a little bit about the work that SLOCAT is doing together with GIZ in trying to really gather some of the key elements of transport in these strategies, in these, in these national voluntary reviews that these countries are putting forward as part of the Paris Agreement. So we're very happy to have you all here today, and we do hope that you'll find this seminar to be very insightful and useful in your work um, as we all kind of work together towards our goal of decarbonizing our transport systems. So next slide, please. Just a little housekeeping rules as we begin today. Obviously, all of you should have your microphones on mute uh, and your videos off so that we can preserve the bandwidth of, of the presentations and the seminar. You can enter chats. If you use the chat function, you can use the chat function to ask questions because there will be a QA uh, section at the end of the presentation. So feel free to do use the chat function to ask any questions. Uh, obviously, you can do more options. In, if you click on the three buttons, as you see there on the screen, uh, and then you can also raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Um, but we, it's probably easier and for the sake of time to ask all your questions using the chat function. And I'll keep an eye on the chat function for all of you. Next slide, please. So I, I, I think we're having an issue with the slide. Um, but if we could go to the next slide. <laughs> I'm showing the agenda. Do you oh, okay, see? here it goes. So just to give you all a, a quick look at the agenda, obviously uh, it began with the welcome by me. And then we're gonna talk about some of the key insights that have been um, discovered in some of the research that we've been doing. And then a deep dive, uh, looking much more closely how transport's playing a role in NDCs and LTS, followed by the open discussion and then next steps. And now I'd like to present to you the two primary speakers who will be um, educating you all today. We have Nadia Tager, who is an advisor at GIZ, working primarily uh, on the ICI project of Advancing Transport Climate Strategies, or TRACS. And then the second speaker is my colleague, Nicola Medimorik, who is a director of data analysis and research at SLOCAT, uh, and who's been really taking a lead from our side on this work related to transport NDCs. So I'd like to give the floor now to Nadia to begin to begin her presentation um, and to give us a look at some of the work that's been happening and the analysis that we've been doing on this topic. So Nadia, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you so much, Chris. I'm not so sure if my internet connection is very stable at the moment, so if it's not, I turn off the video, just let me know um, so that we can focus on the presentation, which is really what is important. Um, in any case, thank you very, very much for your interest. Uh, my name is Nadia, I work at GIZ. Like uh, Chris said, I work on transport and climate change. And uh, together with uh, SLOCAD, we set up this database and um, this analysis with the help of uh, our consultant Marion Fiebig that uh, I would like to present to you today. Um, I think we all agree that the time to act on climate change really is now like uh, the COP motto of COP25 back in the day in Madrid. Uh, and 2020 and 2021 were important years for uh, nationally determined contributions and the long-term strategies because uh, since 2020 it's mandatory for each signatory to the Paris Agreement to submit uh, such a national climate plan. And I think we need to, if we don't want to look at transport and ambition and transport, we also need to look at the overall picture. So this is why I brought with me this graph from the UNFCCC Secretariat that in its uh, synthesis report found that the second generation NDC, so all those new NDCs that have been handed in um, until October, I think uh, last year, imply actually a further increase in greenhouse gas emissions of around 16% by uh, 2030 compared to 2010-10. Um, and that means that if we don't take further action, we will see a temperature increase of around 2.7 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, which is obviously far more than the 1.5 degrees that we are aiming for, according to the Paris Agreement. Um, so we see this gap and we see that current indices aren't sufficient. And um, 
we would like to to know, of course, or wanted to know what uh, where, where transport stays. Um, uh, transport is, of course, not the only sector that is relevant for for uh, mitigating climate change. But if we look at this graph, I think we can all agree that it's one of the most relevant sectors. We are currently, according to the International Energy Agency, at around uh, eight gigatons of transport related emissions globally. And um, when we take into account that transport has the highest reliance on fossil fuels of any sector, um, I think we really need to start thinking about the future of transport. And as you can see in this chart that I'm that I'm sharing, we uh, we really need to uh, drop uh, emissions or need to reduce emissions already by 75% of current levels to get anywhere close to the 1.5 or 2 degrees targets of the, of the Paris Agreement. Um, so I think with this in mind, it's very clear that there is really no continuing of business as usual and that we need uh, drastic reductions in emissions um, right now. What that could mean, um, I would like to show you a slide, a figure that I brought with me for, for Germany, some figures from, from Germany, from the German Environment Agency, the UBA, um, which um, show how, like what would need to happen, how it would look like. In Germany, we do have a climate change act that requires us to halve our emissions uh, by 2030 in comparison to 1990. But as you can see, we stand uh, at still at very, very high emissions, despite Corona, of course, this little drop, but in general at uh, very high emissions in, in, in transport and overall, and a need a drastic, a drastic reduction. Um, so I think those, those, uh, those with the instrument that we have um, are NDCs and long-term strategies, among others. Um, we... We th therefore ask ourselves, what, how do the NDCs actually look like in terms of transport? So if we, if we know if, if the Paris Agreement targets are out of reach, if we continue to neglect transport, where do we actually stand in terms of NDCs and, and long-term strategies? Uh, somebody unmuted themselves, is there a question? Okay, otherwise I'll continue. Um, we have... Uh, around 132 second generation NDCs uh, submitted so far as of now to the UNFCCC Secretariat. Second generation NDCs is what we call um, the, the updated NDCs and the second NDCs. So we have a few second NDCs and more updated NDCs, but there's really no, no difference quality wise. It's just a question of the time frame of a country's uh, first submission, whether it's now handing in a second or an updated NDC. In theory, all NDCs that are submitted are supposed to show higher ambition levels than the previous one. In practice, um, well, there are a few exceptions from that rule. So in comparison, we had in the first round of NDCs, 168 NDCs submitted, representing 192 countries, and we currently stand at 156 countries. So that means we are still awaiting submissions from uh, from from some countries, from some regions. You can see in the left graph that um, there are still some submissions to be awaited from uh, Latin America, for example, from countries in Oceania or Africa, also in Asia. And there are still some big emitters uh, missing, for example, India that has announced um, targets and actions at the last COP, but has not yet so officially submitted any documents. Um, you can also see in the, in the graphs on the right that um, only 8% of global transport sector emissions are covered uh, by NDCs that, that contain a transport target. Um, so that is not a lot, uh, especially if you consider that um, most of these transport sector targets are not even sector wide. Uh, but I will go into depth on that uh, later. Um, and if we con uh, consider that the emissions growth in transport is expected for to happen mostly in, in non-OECD countries and in low to middle income countries, I think, um, yeah, it's quite clear that this is really right now is, a, is an opportunity for them to, to include um, their plans and ambitious climate uh, strategies for transport in the NDCs that are still to be submitted. Um, for the long-term strategies, uh, we stand at uh, 50 long-term strategies. That includes um, the EU overall, but also a couple of EU members that have uh, submitted their own 
strategy. So we arrive at this uh, number of 59. Um, and what we can see here is that um, those those long term strategies with transport targets only cover around one quarter of transport emissions. And it's interesting to mention that uh, we have not yet seen any long term strategy from a low income country. Um, long term strategies are well, countries are invited to submit those, so they're not mandatory like NDCs. Um, so that's why the number is lower, but I think it remains interesting to see, especially what the big emitter, uh, emitters are, are planning. So let's take a look at what is actually included in those in those uh, strategies and uh, contributions. Um, we have here, or you can see here, two graphs um, that um, about the, the targets, the net zero targets, and overall targets that are included in the in NDCs and LTS. So NDCs contain um, targets that span across sectors, so those economy-wide targets. And as I said before, those uh, for the NDCs uh, would lead to a warming of 2.7 uh, degrees, according to the UNFCCC Secretariat. Um, but beyond NDCs and LTS, countries have also handed in net zero targets. So we use numbers from uh, Climate Watch. They have this net zero tracker, and they come to uh, 74 um, targets uh, overall. Our number is a little bit different. Um, I think we counted some numbers in NDCs and LTS, uh, some targets that they didn't, but overall the picture remains uh, similar. So we have quite a lot of net zero targets. There's a lot of talk about net zero targets and net zero pathways, um, but only 30 countries that have net zero targets also back them with transport targets. You can see that on the right. So um, we we look at NDCs and LTS, so there might be targets that are um, for transport that are expressed somewhere else and um, that we haven't considered here. But if we really limit our analysis to NDCs and LTS, we see 30, 30 countries with net zero targets and transport targets. And um, of those, only 13 countries have uh, have targets, greenhouse gas targets, emission targets for their entire transport sector. Other countries only uh, look at, at certain sectors. Um, for example, uh, the United Kingdom plans to deliver a net zero rail network by 2050 um, and wants to reduce emissions in aviation and shipping to net zero by 2050. Um, it remains interesting to see how they will get there, but it's definitely great that they have included that already in their, in their long-term strategy. And um, what also is interesting or important to say, I think, is um, that the only high income countries that included transport emission targets in their new NDCs are Andorra, Israel, the Seychelles and Japan. So except for Japan, the on, there are no big emitters yet that have uh, that have committed to to transport targets to so really um, quantifiable transport targets. Um, Let's see, there's some, some more information on, on those mitigation targets. We have, um, we have uh, also looked at um, other kinds of targets, so transport non-greenhouse gas targets is what we call those. For example, about, um, about the share of, of EVs in, in, uh, in the vehicle fleet of a country, um, all those kinds of things. Um, and those are increasing, so there is an increasing number of targets in the NDCs and LTS, but um, not enough yet. A nice uh, example that I would like to give is Belgium that um, included in its long term strategy uh, really a net zero target for transport by 2050. And it, wants, it looks at a 100% reduction of transport emissions and that's um, across the whole sector. So that's really, really uh, a nice example, I think. If we move away now from targets uh, and look at um, mitigation actions in the in the NDCs and LTS, um, there is some good news. So um, this in this round of NDCs, we have uh, 80 uh, NDC 80 percent of NDC documents that include transport mitigation measures. So really, uh, mitigation actions and measures that um, uh, aim at, at at the transport sector. That compares to around 60% of, um, of NDCs that included such measures in the first round of NDCs. 
Um, what's maybe not so great about those is that many of them remain very vague. So they talk about the promotion of public transport or the introduction of electric mobility um, or the creation of some other kind of low carbon option. I uh, give you here on the slide some quotes, um, of course not mentioning any countries, um, that that should give you an impression of um, well of how, how vague those, those statements are. Sometimes, of course, not all of them, but many and um, that are rather a statement about intent or the desired outcome than really communicating or specifying how those countries plan to get there. And of course, since there's really not anything obligatory about uh, what you include in your NDC, except of course for your economy-wide target, um, countries don't have to specify what they really mean with this or how they want to get to uh, decarbonizing their public transport, for example. But um, it, at least referencing national policies, well, national policy documents such as transport strategies, for example, where more detail could be found would be very, very helpful. I think for, for other national governments, but also um, other actors that would need some incentive on, on really getting active on these topics. Um, and if we now look at and what kind of, of mitigation measures were included. We, we divided um, or we categorized uh, mitigation measures in, in, in um, a couple of five uh, categories. And we see here that you see it on that uh, on the graph as well. Uh, we see a focus on electrification of transport systems and on uh, alternative fuels and energy vectors. Um, let's see on the next slide. Um, this leads me to, to my second point. So we have, we see in the NDCs and also in the long-term strategies, a very strong focus on electrification and electric mobility. So um, you see here then that more than half of all second generation NDCs contain some kind of reference to electric mobility and electrification in their NDCs. That is, um, that equals up to around 70 countries. They don't only focus on road transport, but very many of them do. Um, some also are about um, electrification of, of aviation and shipping, like the UK example I just uh, gave you before. But um, there is a heavy, heavy focus on road transport. And um, also, if we look at the types of targets I mentioned before, that we have uh, not only looked at greenhouse gas uh, transport targets, but also at other kinds of targets. And there, there was also the strong focus on on, um, on electric mobility on the, like I said before, in this uh, share of, of electric vehicles, for example, in the overall vehicle fleet and so on. Um, what is important, of course, when we talk about electrification of transport and electric mobility is that it's backed with uh, renewable energy, of course, because otherwise it's hardly a measure, a good measure for, for mitigating emissions. Um, and here, unfortunately, um, the link is not as strong as it should be. Um, most NDCs do not uh, consider how, or at least they don't mention, um, how transport electrification and the use of alternative fuels will impact their renewable power systems. And of course, um, decarbonizing transport won't be possible if we don't link um, this electrification and electric mobility to renewable energy. Um, there are two quotes on this slide there that uh, show that um, some countries do it differently. So, um, I mean, especially for hydrogen production, for using hydrogen to fuel shipping and aviation and, and, and heavy uh, duty vehicle, vehicles, um, we, we really need a, a lot of renewable energy, actually. And most countries do not mention that. But um, Chile does, which I think is great. And also Tanzania makes clear that they want to use uh, renewable and uh, clean energy to, to promote uh, the transport system electrification. Uh, I will not go into further detail about mitigation actions. Uh, my colleague Nicola from SLOCAT will tell you more about um, mitigation in the NDCs and uh, we'll look at, at the avoid, shift and improve framework. Um, but the last topic that I would like to present to you and touch upon is the freight sector. Um, I think we all know that Freight is uh, a very, very relevant uh, transport subsector. Uh, in 2015, the movement of goods cost at 42% of all greenhouse gas emissions globally. And um, 
we we will see an increase in that according to the ITF uh, scenarios, recovery scenario, um, to sh the share of 44%, um, which it would be then 22% higher uh, in 2050 than it was in 2015. So we need to take action on freight, and if we take action, we can actually see a reduction of 72% according to ITF with the right policies in place. Um, Unfortunately, freight remains overlooked. That was already the case in the first generation of NDCs, and it's still so. It's a little bit better for, for long-term strategies um, that, that do reference uh, freight. You see here on this chart on the left, um, the, the number of measures, so the number really of, 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 of singular uh, references to freight or to passenger transport and above the number of countries that reference passenger or freight transport at least once in their in their uh, NDC in blue and their LTS in, in green. Um, and you see that there are way more references to passenger transport than to freight, but there are some countries that um, that take up freight in their in their documents. But um, the only target, for example, that is uh, that contains a reference to freight uh, is um, the, a target in the United Kingdom's uh, long term strategy that aims to remove uh, diesel only trains uh, for passenger and freight transport from the network by 2040. But this is really it. There are no other targets um, or no other, yeah, no other transport tar targets uh, aimed explicitly at, at freight. Um, and of those that include of those mitigation measures, for example, that that are aimed at freight, many remain vague. So there is, for example, this one quote uh, that I would like to read that is uh, green logistics will, de will be developed speedily, transport resources will be optimized and the overall utilization efficiency will be advanced. I mean, that's great, but it would be even better if, if we could understand a bit better how that is to be achieved. Um, and many uh, countries actually focus on technology um, in in their in their quest for for mitigating freight emissions. So there is this there's a talk of uh, shifting from road to rail, but there's also, for example, a lot of uh, references to or quite some references to hydrogen use uh, for heavy goods vehicles. Um, for example, uh, Morocco mentions green hydrogen in its in its long term strategy that they that they submitted uh, at the end of December. Um, and that really brings me to the last point about about the freight sector. So there is uh, lots of, of um, references uh, that are have this heavy uh, technology focus, but unfortunately there are very, very, very few uh, references to systems efficiency. So I think that is something that we and we can all work on to really uh, put more focus on all those emissions that we could, or right, the huge saving potential actually that uh, lies in systems efficiency in, uh, instead of only fo focusing on on those vehicle and technology focused measures. Um, yeah, you see in this in the graph um, how how little um, system efficiency is mentioned. There is only around uh, two percent of NDCs um, that that aim to expand a rail and waterway infrastructure, for example, for freight, and um, only only a one point six percent of measures look at, at efficiency of freight vehicles. Um, so yeah, very, very few explicit references, very few uh, looking at systems efficiency and um, really a huge potential, I think, that remains overlooked. Um, with that, uh, I come to the end of my presentation. So I'd like to highlight once more that uh, we really need to act now, that uh, emissions and transport are rising and that we cannot really rely on offsetting emissions from transport forever. So we do need to strengthen those plans. Um, and even though net zero targets overall become more popular, we um, are still missing this link or this backup by a paradigm shift in transport that we so urgently need. Um, mitigation measures become increasingly important, as I said, but they remain vague. And um, that, is, that makes it difficult for us to assess what is actually meant and in the future, maybe also whether this has actually been achieved and implemented. And um, not surprisingly, electrification, electric mobility are the talk of the day, um, but the link to renewable energy is not either not there or not explicitly referenced, at least. 
And like I just said, um, the freight sector really needs more attention. So this was only a peak. And I think I took way too much time. I'm sorry. So if you want to learn more about uh, NDCs and LTS, uh, you can take a look at the tracker that we developed together with Slowcat. And of course, there is our brochure um, there where you can where you can learn more. We also have, if you are interested in how you can then en enhance uh, climate ambition and transport, we devised those six uh, recommendations that you can uh, take a look at. We'll send around the presentation later, so that's why I'm I'm running through it. And then I wanted to point you to um, the transport week that is taking place in May, where you can exchange with uh, with other experts, with other colleagues that work on transport, what else we can do to mitigate emissions and to take action in in transport. So uh, with that, thank you very much. Sorry for taking so much time. And back to you, Chris. Thank you, thank Nadia. You, Nadia. Thank you for the great presentation and for giving us some insights on some of the issues that we're facing in trying to decarbonize transport systems globally. Um, so I see that there are some questions trickling into the chat, Nadia, so if you want to have a look for later on, um, I mean, we can we can try to answer those together with Nicola once he's given his presentation, but if you want to have a look, they're all there. Okay, I'd like to now pass the floor to my colleague, Nicola Medimorek, who's going to talk about some deep dives related to transport NDCs and long-term strategies. Um, so the floor is yours, Nicola. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I hope you can hear me well. <clears throat> um, before I start with my presentation, and yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Also, thanks a lot, Nadia, for the um, insights um, shared from the GSZ brochure. Uh, before I start, I want to briefly um, introduce Slowkit, just in case if somebody doesn't know yet um, what the Slowkit partnership actually is. Um, so Slowkit is the international multi-stakeholder partnership that enables collaborative knowledge and action for sustainable low carbon transport and brings the voice of the movement into international climate change and sustainability processes. With a primary focus on land transport and the geographic footprint targeted the Global South, Slowcat delivers on its mission through three mutually reinforcing work streams that you can see on the streams here. Um, we have a very engaging and vibrant international ecosystem of, of um, over 90 entities that uh, across all kinds of different actors and different stakeholders, NGOs and so on, working on, on transport and related areas. Now, Slowcat, we authored uh, the following report that you can see here on the slide, together with inputs from GIZ. And it's also again based on the tracker of climate strategies for transport that um, GIZ and Slowcat are working on together. In this report, the analyze actions and ambition of climate strategies submitted by countries in the framework of the Paris Agreement. And we try to seek and to establish to what extent actually these climate strategies and how much does the transport content um, is on track to deliver on the Paris Agreement goal of limiting global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. The report identifies um, the gaps and also shortcomings of climate action on transport in, in the NDCs and long-term strategies, and also tries to come up with um, recommendations on how to um, yeah, solve and how to bridge these gaps. Now, I will deep dive into some mitigation adaptation actions without trying to repeat what um, Nadia said and, and give you some additional information on, on some key aspects. Here, in this uh, figure on the left, the outer circles, uh, the black outer circles, they, they um, represent the major categories that we have in our database. And the bubbles that you can see there, the colored bubbles, are the subcategories. Um, and the number of, of or the size of the bubbles and the number of the, or the size of the outer circles represents how many actions have been um, 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 it identified in, in the second generation NDCs. As Osnatia presented, mode shift, demand man, mode shift and demand management, as well as low carbon fuels and energy vectors, are kind of the two biggest um, categories. But if we look at the subcategories, then we have electric mobility actually as the most um, popular or like the, 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 the subcategory with the highest number of actions. And here again, it, it reflects that um, the Second generation NDCs focus very much on on um, 
efficiency or improving the efficiency of current systems and the, there's a lack for more transformative um, measures and, and, and systems that enable a, a more um, better transfer system and, and help us to reach uh, net zero transfer systems by 2050. Connected to this, um, this previous slide here, now you can see how the actions are associated to the void shift and improve framework. Um, I hope most of you are familiar with it. Um, if not, we can also like discuss it in the, in the, in the Q and A session or a section, or you can also go to the link um, provided here. Um, in the figure and the Senki diagram on the slide on the left, again you can see the, the bubbles that we had on the previous slide, and here you can also see how they are attributed to passenger freight and um, and um, or, gen or in general, or even a combination of passenger and freight. Um, and, but Nadia already explained this this issue in, in, in detail. But then for me, I want to focus now on how these actions are actually associated to avoid, shift, improve, or a combination of them. Um, we assess them always in terms of the context, so like how was the action framed within the climate strategy, and then be associated to one of these or, or a combination of these um, different elements. And again, you can see how um, there's a strong bias towards um, improve and there's a strong lack of shift and avoid. We even see a decrease, like compared to the first generation of NDCs, we see even a dec decrease of a shift related actions in, in, in the climate strategies. And now <clears throat> we also looked at uh, climate adaptation. And um, probably if you follow the discussions and you saw that the discussion and negotiations around climate adaptation have been really strengthened. And um, in terms of the overall content on climate adaptation, we actually see a lot more, more um, in, in, the, in the new NDCs and even some second generation NDCs only focused on um, um, yeah, climate adaptation. However, if you look at focus on, on transport, we see um, still that the majority of actions are limited towards uh, road infrastructure resilience. So um, also this word cloud on the right, it um, <clears throat> shows the most frequently used um, words in, in regarding adaptation measures in NDCs. And there you can see how infrastructure, road, um, resilient, construction development dominates and, and there's a, a lack for more institutional and more um, uh, more actions that may be tailored towards the adaptation of, of, of uh, or adaptation through public transport or specific modes or again um, how maybe adaptation would work together with the freight systems or supply chains and so on. Now our report comes up with a lot of conclusions that um, try to summarize the findings and here these are the three conclusions that we already had uh, that I showed in the, in the previous couple of slides. And there are also like many other um, topics discussed, like governance. Also, we, we discussed freight. Uh, we discussed the lack of um, submissions by low income countries in, in, in the NDCs, which is even more severe in, in long term strategies, as um, Nadia also mentioned. And, um, also, I want to briefly use this opportunity to introduce another report that SLOCAT has released um, as part of the Climate Change Conference COP26. So um, we, after the conference, we released a report called COP26 Outcomes for Sustainable Low Carbon Transport, where we provide a very critical analysis of the transport relevant content of the Glasgow Climate Pact. And I would very much recommend you to, to read it and to better understand what kind of impacts the Glasgow Climate Pact has on, on, on transport and our work as a community. Um, also, as part of this report, we've done a preliminary analysis of the major transport initiatives and commitments that were launched on the occasion of, of the COP26 uh, conference. And we then cross-referenced them with the content of the NDCs by the signatory countries. And as you can see here in this result in this figure, um, we came to the conclusion that actually many uh, signatories of these, these initiatives and commitments um, do not really back these um, content through the NDCs. So um, 
kind of the overall conclusion is here a lot of more work is is um is left and we need to work a lot more in coming months to align the enhanced and updated and deceased uh, to these commitments and that's all from from my side and i will give it back to um chris for the q a thank you nicola i think you can all hear me now um so I, i'm looking for any questions in the chat box but i think the ones that we did get <laughs> were answered directly by by nadia as nicola was presenting so we'll keep the chat open for a couple of more minutes or to see if anybody has any questions people can also unmute if they want i think they have the option yes. and i see one one comment from diego saying that adaptation and trans transport requires more attention in low income countries of course we agree and um we also we looked at adaptation like, like nicola said adaptation is part of our analysis there's also a blog article where we focus uh, specifically on on adaptation and resilience in in transport i can i will show share the link with you in a second and it's definitely something that that um, quite some countries have taken up, especially in, in comparison to the first round of NDCs. Adaptation plays a bigger role. Yes. OK, are there any other questions or comments for our presenters? And as mentioned before, this information will be shared with all of you, um, you know, following the, the, the seminar. So you'll have access to to all of this information. Also, the the data where will, I can post a link in a second with the Excel that contains all the data, like from all the entries that or the references that we took from all those documents that we analyzed, so that you can do your own analysis if you want. But I see that Juan Benitez has a hand up. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, has a hand up. Yes. Yeah. Juan. Uh, Go ahead. Can I do it aloud or or should I write it down? No, please. It's better. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm part of uh, UNEP's teams in Latin America, and I just had a question about uh, sort of aggregating the data by region. If you guys did that, and sort of what is your perspective on sort of uh, regional insights that you got from the work that you did? It's great okay. that you can... <laughs> That you mentioned that uh, because that is actually something that we plan to do and i think nicola will present uh, when he talks about the next steps that we plan to take so there are we have not yet uh, looked specifically at, at the regions but um we want to do that um also in alliance with the regional climate weeks that come up so very good point perfect thank you looking forward to it thank you juan there are it is also questions coming into the chat. We have a question here from Torben Heinemann. He's saying, why do you think that countries do not back their goals? And then a question from Risha. Is there any exhaustive list of indices which should ideally be incorporated for transportation goals? I don't know if there is one definite answer to Torben's question on why countries not, don't back their goals. I mean, you could say maybe transport is just not on the agenda enough or um, in another another answer could be that it's just maybe too hard and too too difficult and to to for countries now the conversation hasn't really started hasn't really picked up maybe uh, and so they don't feel like they can commit to to really specific targets for transport in their in their plans but a real definite answer i couldn't give up i don't know nicola what you think yeah, I think I think you summarized it very well. Um, kind of um, transport is always seen as as kind of the sector which is most difficult to decarbonize. But um, I mean we have all the solutions that we need are, are, are more or less there. Um, um, the technologies and so on. Um, it's just really kind of to really scale them up to um, yeah, and implement them in a very comprehensive manner and and a balanced manner. What through a voice shift and improve as as we showed. Yeah. And I'll maybe if I can directly pick up the next question on, on the indices, um, there I, f I think it, it's probably the best if you look at um, um, SLOCAT's NDC recommendations and also like at that um, GSS six action recommendations. So they they can find actually good guidance on, on what is really needed in, in the NDCs. And um, I think we, we can also like um, we linked it in our presentations. Um, also afterwards we can share it again with you. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the guidance on how, what really needs to be within the NDCs on to reflect um, yeah, low carbon transport. 
Thank you. And now we see a couple of more questions coming in, one from Diego Fontorno. Um, what could be the cause of the low level of objectives to reduce GHG emissions in the transport sector? And then a question from Shanko Josh, what transport demand per capita, GDP per capita, and population and GDP projections are generally taken for these analysis? <laughs> Maybe, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> To, to answer the going to the first question, like the second question is very very specific. Uh, but like first uh, on the first question on the um um what, what's the cause of the low low levels of ambition? Um, many NDCs also like especially from from low income countries or lower middle income countries may, uh, mention a lack of um capacity in term and then a uh, uh, lack of of technology uh, um, within the country. So like um. It's also the issue of kind of how well they are aware of certain solutions and, and how well they have access actually to, to implement um, more sustainable low carbon transport. So, um, and then also we really recommend and, 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 and um, encourage countries to, like, also you should state and, and mention the, the any capacity issues. So, um, because that's where international organizations then can pick up and help you to um, um, improve it further. I don't know, not if you you want anything um well there are, no actually i think you you answered it very well maybe what we could add is that uh, we did divide um the, all the kinds of targets that are included in whether they are conditional or unconditional and um for of course for high income countries uh, most most targets uh, or actions are unconditional and don't rely on any any kind of support from other countries but many 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 countries um, low and in, uh, middle income countries included conditional targets and i think that shows that really there is um there is a lack of wealth of finance but also of course of, of technical assistance to those countries and if you if you look at because of time constraints i see we are almost running out but if you look at the tracker and if you look at the excel you will also see or find an, a sheet on investment needs that are laid down like some countries really put a number to uh, to the kind of support and the, the resources they would need to implement um or to yeah to commit to further action and implement their transport plans so maybe that is a good resource. And then uh, the question about the data that we that we used. Well, we didn't really make um, any projections ourselves, but um, the mm -hmm. data that we used to put everything into perspective comes from the SLOCAT uh, knowledge base. And I think, I mean, you guys are best to answer that, but uh, emissions data, for example, comes from EDGA. And I think uh, you, you look at uh, the World Bank for, for many uh, of the data points that you included. Um, yeah, yeah, I see that there's there's a couple of more questions coming in, and, and our colleague from Slocat, Emily, is responding to some of them. Um, but I do think we're running out of time, and it's great to see that so many people are interested in the topic that was presented to you all. I know, Nicola, you have one more little bit to include in, in this presentation. So if you want to go ahead and take, take that away, and then we can finish up uh, in a few minutes. Yeah. Um, thanks, Eva. Let me... Sorry, I'm not. So, kind of um, before we go to the next steps, uh, we want also like to briefly actually to. Um, I hope you can see my screen now, and also please let me know if you, if you have issues seeing the the top part on on of the screen. But um, so actually, before we go to the next steps, also we would like to get some inputs from you. So if you could please go to menti.com and use the code. Two nine five seven eight one two seven, um, and maybe provide. We give you like one or two minutes, very quick, just to um, provide any inputs to this question on what kind of further analysis you would like to see um, in the future, and what kind of topics uh, interest you the most. Um, I think that would be very much very valuable actually to, yeah, to help us also like um, shape the the future on the next. Um, Next, next iteration of our uh, reports and brochures and, and analysis. So, just need to go to on your browser to menti.com and then yeah, and, and put in some things. Um, and thanks to see the first um, came in. So, equity is a uh, very Important issue. Thanks a lot. That's um, regional analysis. Um, great. Mm, 
I'll just wait a little bit more um, if there are no further ideas, but also like this menti, I will, I will actually leave it open and we will um, also like um, digest everything afterwards. So um, even if we're not going to discuss it, um, it's great to have actually your your inputs also like, yeah, city level, um, it's very interesting. We also we looked at kind of the local or like actions that support local or urban transport actions or, or, or national urban transport mechanisms and so on. Um, yeah, also connected to equity, of course, the impact on, on jobs would be very interesting. Yeah, or even to road safety and assessment models. Create. Oh, and I need to scroll already now, thanks. OK, very interesting topics and also like for this question on politics. Um, and communication, I, f I feel it also like a, somewhere we don't have to answer right now. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for sharing it. And because we are running out of time, um, I will now move um, to the next. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll move to the next steps. And um, just very briefly introduce to you what we have planned in the coming uh, months from now. So we will do a couple of improvements to the um, track of climate searches for transport. We will add new features and also try to make them more accessible and, and actually increase the um, um, yeah, the easiness of using it, the, this, this database. Because we also hope to, to have many of you encouraged through our analysis that you also do your own analysis and do your own research um, through this tracker. Also, the tracker will be further expanded, as um, Natalia was briefly, as was briefly mentioned. It will include any transport relevant documents referenced in, in NDCs and long-term strategies. So this means if the NDC mentions a transport strategy or mentions um, um, a transport plan, um, then we will also now try to expand and to include this one in our tracker. So expand and slowly um, add more and more doc documents and more reporting mechanisms into our um, tracker. Um, also, thanks for bringing up the point of the regional analysis uh, um, through your questions and through your comments now in the Mentimeter, um, because we will be planning for regional assessments in in in, li uh, in line with the UNFCCC Regional Climate Week. So, like um, the MENA week is, is uh, MENA Climate Week is at the end of February. So, by then we hope to have a MENA uh, regional analysis infographic um, released, and then also for the same for the other regions um, um, when we. The regional climate weeks are being held. And also there are further advocacy campaigns that we want to highlight the good practices um, because the COP26 or the Glasgow Climate Pact um, encouraged or requested countries to uh, submit enhanced updated NDCs. So we want to also to, to do advocacy campaigns to support and to, to um, encourage countries to strengthen their transport content in, 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 the, in the NDCs. And as well, we want to um, highlight good practices and, and, and provide inputs to the global stock take that's going to be taken um, all throughout this year and the next year. Yeah, and that's all from my side. Um, back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you, Nadia, for your insights and, and your presentations. I hope everybody found it very interesting and very useful. Um, and I hope you will continue to, to use this information that's being gathered and compiled uh, as it helps you in your work and your advocacy in, in the work that we're all doing around decarbonizing our transport systems and trying to achieve the goal of sustainable low carbon transport. So thank everybody for your participation. And we hope we will see you in future webinars and sessions just like this and look forward to receiving more information about the work that's being done by SLOCAT and GIZ on this topic. So thank you and have a wonderful day, evening, wherever you are in the world. Take care, everyone.